Hey, this is Chris Kopik for Intagma. Mo and I spent the last weeks and months diving deep into the more technical aspects of neural networks and image generators. And we found a lot of really interesting and fascinating topics to talk about. One of those topics is navigating the latent space of neural nets. Mo has already published two practical tutorials using Stable Diffusion inside the MLOps toolset, one about prompt arithmetics and one about random walks around a prompt. This week I want to give you a lot more insight into what a latent space actually is and how it is created. In this case, not by using stable diffusion, but by building and training our own neural net inside Houdini, whose only job is to create a very simple latent space for us to explore. In this video, we'll go over the main concepts and the theory of a latent space, and on Thursday, in the advanced setups course on our Patreon, we'll actually build the entire setup using Houdini and PyTorch. Most of the visualizations that you're about to see are built directly in Houdini and you can find a common version of the setup in the scene files. I can highly recommend giving them a try yourself as this really helps gaining a deeper understanding of those concepts. Just make sure you install MLOps first to get access to both NumPy and PyTorch inside Houdini which are needed to run this scene. But now let's get to our latent space. So what you're seeing here is our latent space and it has one goal and that's organizing handwritten digits. This organization is just based on the shape of these digits, not their numerical value. And in fact, these could just as well be handwritten letters or symbols or photos of different animals. And in that perspective, a grouping here makes sense. Each digit has its own little bubble. And for example, the bubble of zeros is right beside the bubble of sixes because these are very similar symbols. And the same goes, for example, for a bubble of sevens and a bubble of ones. These groupings are not something that I specifically programmed in. It's something the neural net came up with by itself just by crunching through thousands of images of handwritten digits. But back to our latent space. By itself, this space is, well, just that, a space with some meaning behind different positions in it, but nothing that directly gives us insight inside its inner workings. However, we can use the neural net that built the space to create visualizers to guide us through it. So for instance, we can give our neural network a whole bunch of pictures of handwritten digits and let it tell us where we would put them in the space. And if these pictures have labels telling us what digit is depicted, we can also add this to each position in space and by that create this map of digits that we looked at before. We can also point to a specific location in the latent space and ask a neural net to create the picture of the digit it imagines lives at that location. If the location we pick is inside the bubble of sevens, we get a seven. If it is inside the bubble of zeros, we get a zero. And if we move it between the bubble of the zeros and the sixes, we get a weird mix of the two. We can also draw a digit ourselves and ask a net where it would put it inside a latent space. And again, if we draw a seven, this gets put inside the bubble of sevens. And if we draw a five, this gets put into the bubbles of fives. And also from that position, we could again ask Annette to draw the picture it imagines lives at that location. And we get an output image that sort of matches our input image. And I think you get the idea by now. Now, handwritten digits probably aren't something that's hugely exciting to you. You probably already know that sixes and zeros look very similar, and you could imagine what a mix between them would look like. But let's imagine for a second what a latent space of famous paintings would look like. And for example, what we could find between the bubbles of Picasso and Dali. And I think this suddenly gets a whole lot more interesting. Also, in essence, what we're seeing here is the same thing that happens to our prompt in stable diffusion. Our input text is converted into a vector vector that points somewhere in its own latent space. And later on, that vector is used to guide the image generation. The other problem is, instead of three dimensions, our latent space in stable diffusion has 80,000 dimensions. Still, what we can do with prompt arithmetic or random walks is very similar to what we can do here. We can start out from a position we know and we can describe and then wander off into the uncharted territory of a latent space and get something that we maybe can't describe with words and we get something totally new and unexpected. Now, we've seen the latent space. Now let's take a look at how it was created. And we should start first by looking at the data it was trained on. 
This is Amnist and it's by far the most popular dataset in machine learning and has become the hello world of pretty much everyone getting started in this field. It consists of 70,000 images of handwritten digits, of which I'm showing the first 100, and labels telling us which digit is depicted. And every picture is 28 by 28 pixels and black and white. Why is it so popular? It's still a very small dataset. Compressed, these 70k images take up just around 64 megabytes of space, and it's very easy and fast to build and train neural nets around it. It's the perfect startup project that gives you good results quickly. Next, let's focus on a neural net. And yes, this looks fairly complicated, but for now we can just simply ignore most of it. Let's start with the input, the output, and the layer in the middle. First of all, we are following the convention of pretty much any neural network nowadays, and we organize our networks into layers, these layers right here and connections between neurons from one layer to the layer directly before and after it. And all of this we call a deep neural net. Now the shape of the first and last layer should make sense to us. It mimics our endless dataset. We have 28 by 28 neurons for 28 by 28 pixels in one endless digit. The shape in the middle should make sense to us as well, although it's a little less obvious. Here we have just three neurons, and that's the same number of neurons as we have dimensions in a latent space. And well, here it is, here lives a latent space. And we have the first part of a neural net to take a picture and convert it to a point in 3D space, and the alpha half to do the opposite, take a point in 3D space and convert it back to a picture. And this hourglass shape of a network is called an autoencoder, because it encodes and decodes data from into a latent space. All encoders are one of the classic beginner machine learning projects. However, they aren't as commonly used in the industry as they used to be. But we do find a lot of similar concepts, for example, in units that play a vital role in image generation or image denoising networks. Also at this point, we should talk a bit about terminology here. We've talked about pixels and neurons and dimensions, and at least in our simple example, these all describe the same thing and as to our boxes in our network diagram. And we could just as well say that our input layer has 28 by 28 dimensions and our latent space has three pixels. It just makes more sense for us as humans to think about it the other way around. Now this concept of taking an input with lots and lots of dimensions and crunching it down to just a few dimensions is a process called dimensionality reduction. And it has multiple applications in machine learning, from speeding up calculations, for example, with unstable diffusion, to noise reduction, for example, in the Intel OpenAI denoiser. What we want to use it for here, however, is deriving meaning from our data. And that sounds very esoteric. So let's look at a metaphor. I can start, for example, with a picture of a chair that consists of a lot of pixels or dimensions. And to get the number of dimensions down as a human, for example, what I could do is to convert this image of a chair, for example, to a description of a chair. Something that could look like this, a chair made of cedar wood with four legs and a solid backrest on a white background. But still, as a human, I can take this description and I can think of, again, a picture of a chair. And the chair might not look exactly the same as the input chair, but it will look very, very close. But what I got by doing this conversion is I now got categories to sort chairs by. I have, for example, the info that this is in fact a chair, I have the type of wood, I have the number of legs, I have the type of backrest or the background. And all of these make much more sense to me than just a whole lot of pixel values. And a neural network does essentially the same thing. However, instead of calling it a chair and specifying the type of wood, it would most likely look more like this. We have four vertical lines at the bottom. We have sort of a blob in the middle and you have sort of a blob at the top. And of course, a neural network won't use words. It will just point to some direction in a space that has three or a lot more dimensions. But still, the core idea is the same. We get better info by cleverly reducing the amount of overall info. And this process in the end is what's creating those digit clouds that we saw earlier.
So we have our training images and we have a net that is able to build a 3D latent space. And our net also has literally thousands of parameters that we can tweak to make this conversion to and from a latent space as sensible as possible. But right now with our freshly built net, all these parameters are just set to random values and as a result our net produces just absolute garbage. So how can we train on it to set all the parameters to the right values to get something like this? So these are the images that I put in. And again, this is a net with no training, so just noise. And then after training, after a little bit of training, we sort of see how numbers appear. And then at our finished net right down here, we see digits that look very much like the input image. Let's imagine an ideal solution first. We take a picture of a data set and we convert this picture to a point in our latent space, and then we convert it back into a picture. And if our net would be performing absolutely perfectly, these two images would match up pixel by pixel perfectly. And so for training a neural net, we do exactly this. We take one picture and we run it through our entire neural net, and we take the output picture and per pixel just compare it to the input image. And we can find all those per pixel differences for both images. And we can give those differences to an optimizer that can tweak all those thousands of parameters in our neural net. And so by that, our net hopefully does better next time. What you might also notice is that although our data set has labels, so we know what digit is depicted, those labels actually don't play any role in our training process. We just work with the image data and compare it to the output. And we call a process like this unsupervised learning. And it's especially helpful if we want our net to make discoveries that we as humans might not have found yet. And isn't that an amazing concept? We can essentially build a neural net that we can present with some sort of set of input images and let the net find its own categorizations just by trying to sensibly reduce the size of the data that's needed to represent that image. And we don't need to give our net any additional info about the contents of those images. Just the images themselves are enough for a net to build a system to order them and to create new images that we haven't seen before. Now, at this point, we're done with the big concepts of this neural net. And if you're not interested in training your own nets and you just wanted more insight into this content of a latent space, you can leave here. If you do, however, want to build your own nets, we'll talk about the last big concepts here we need to understand before we can jump into Houdini and PyTorch. Before we look at anything, I have to give credit where credit is due, because most of the PyTorch code is built after a great walkthrough by Eugenia Anello, and the link to her article on Medium is in the description. Let's first of all take a second look at the structure of a net. What I did here is I've drawn the connections of one neuron of one layer to all the neurons that it is connected to to the layer before it. And the first thing we notice is that our net seems to be mirrored around a latent space layer. It's not an exact mirror image, but this kind of structure is very common in autoencoders as the logical way to get back to the same number of output neurons as the input layer. And we call the first half of our net the encoder and the second half of our net the decoder. If you look at the way our neurons are arranged in space and connected between layers, we can further divide our encoder and decoder into two sections. We have a grid-like convolutional section right here and a line-like linear section right here. Let's look at the linear section first. If you've seen depictions of neural nets in the media, you've probably seen a net made up of linear layers. In this type of layer, each input is connected to every output to the layer before it. And that's also why we sometimes call those layers fully connected layers. And the reason we use it here is mainly to get just a ton of connections and a ton of parameters to tweak just within a few layers. In our convolutional sections, our neurons are wired up differently. Here, one neuron of our current layer is connected to a group of three by three neurons in the layer before it. And this might also look familiar to you if you've been a long time subscriber to Intagma, because this looks very much like a setup for a kernel that we can use, for example, for edge detection or blurring or other filters for our images. And well, that's exactly what's happening here we're essentially forcing a neural net to come up with different filters for images. And every grid here represents a different filter our net can create. So for a first layer, 
we get eight filters. For a second layer, we get 16 filters. And for a third layer, we get a total of 32 filters. The reason we use convolutional layers in our net is simply because they do a great job in working with images and computer vision tasks. And we actually find the same kind of convolutional layers, for example, in stable diffusion or AI denoises and so on. But this is the entirety of a neural net. And let's now take a final look at the entire training procedure and then we can jump into Udini and PyTorch. So first of all, the first thing that we need to do is decide on a set of hyperparameters. And this is essentially like choosing, for example, the constraint types and constraint iterations and substeps for a vellum sim. These are parameters that control the overall performance of a net and not just that of a single neuron. And in our case, those hyperparameters are, of course, the structure of a net that we looked at earlier, but also the loss function, a method of calculating the error when comparing the input image to the output image, an optimizer, so a method of tweaking the thousands and thousands of parameters in our neural net, a learning rate, so basically how much we want to tweak each parameter with each simulation step, and the number of epochs. And we get to what this is a bit later. Once we have our hyperparameters, we can take our training data, our MNIST set, and we can divide it into two different sets. We have a training set and a testing set. And like for instance in school, we want to keep the training and testing data separate. So our net can't just memorize the right answers, so to speak, but it needs to learn the methods to get to the right solutions. And once we have this, our training starts. First of all, we take our training set and we divide it into batches, in our case, in batches of 256 images. And we feed those batches through our encoder to our latent space and our decoder to get our images back. And then we feed both the input image and the image that we reconstructed into our loss function to compare the two. And then we feed the result of our loss function to our optimizer and the optimizer will tweak all those thousands of parameters of our neural net. And once we've crunched through all our training images, we crunch through our testing images and the process looks very much the same. We again divide our images into batches, we feed them through our net and we compare it with a loss function. We just don't pass them to our optimizer because we don't want to optimize anything here. We just want to test how good our net performs. And for instance, if our training loss is constantly decreasing but our testing loss is staying a lot higher, we can see that we're doing something wrong. But if both decrease at the same time, then our net is doing fine. And we call this process of crunching through all our training images and all our testing images, we call the process an epoch, and we'll do that multiple times. And for example, for our net, we do that 30 times. And in our case, we're done here. However, if we would build a neural net for production, or we weren't sure on the right loss function, or optimizer, and so on, we would also get a third testing set for images, a validation set. And after we're done with our epoch training, we could run this test data through a validation set and get an average validation loss, and then just create wedges of different hyperparameters and just compare all those different validation losses that we get. And then in the end, choose the hyperparameters that create a net with the lowest average validation loss. And that's all I have to tell you today. And I hope you'll be joining on Thursday when we actually build the setup in Houdini and PyTorch. But until next time, it's cheers and goodbye.